re-rate request where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff. I was out running this morning and uh, I was listening to one of your favorite songs, which would be Centuries by Fall Out Boy. And I was going by, uh, saw your neighborhood and thought I would go running down through there. And it's a very nice neighborhood. Uh, Mm -hmm. Are you apparently a mountain goat? Because the hills in your neighborhood are the most brutal things that I have attempted to run. Yeah, they're they're really steep. Yeah. It's yeah, I was like, I I felt like I was going to trip and just roll all the way down to the bottom of the neighborhood. And and I know that part of it is, is that in Charlottesville, we're just trying to put housing wherever we can. And so they picked the side of a mountain, apparently, for yours, for for your neighborhood side of a ridgeline. Yeah. No. So when are you going to go run in with me? Um, When I'm physically in better shape. (laughs) Oh, come on. Uh, Significantly so. Uh, I need to. I actually do need to start getting back in shape but it's been it's been a year and i've that's been i can't run with a mask on yeah yeah you could stay on the stay stay on the far way so whenever i'm running i do run so i keep a mask with me i keep Mm -hmm. i have like a running mask that i keep like wrapped around my my wrist Mm -hmm. and i've gotten pretty good at just you know ninja batmaning up like really quick and um I get all sorts of res- just responses from people because I, you know, I'm just like, want to keep, I'm going to keep my distance. I mean, they don't know me from anyone, you know, it's, I, I'm huffing right. and puffing. So, you know, I'll just go ahead and mask up. And some people just kind of give me like the smile and the nod. And some people look at me like, this guy's about to jump me. He's about to, <laughs> <laughs> he's about to rob me. He, to- <laughs> he's, he's part of that. He's part of that crazy surgeons gang running around. I mean, <laughs> with, with their medical masks. Okay, in all fairness, my running mask does... I, it, I, it, yeah. it is more svelte than right, your standard yeah, surgeon's right. mask. But, I mean, it's just like... I. Uh, in, in what universe would I ever look intimidating? Because here I am in my, you know, Charlottesville 10-miler shirt, out of breath, coming up <laughs> this huge hill out of your neighborhood, and then here's a woman with their little dog, and I swear it looked like this woman was about to pick up her dog and hold it close to her chest that I was just <laughs> going to pick up the dog just run away with it. But I don't know. But uh, uh, how has it? How has your your uh, latest week been? Anything interesting going on in your classes? Yeah, we uh, we've had some incidents. On uh, regarding academic honesty, which we are addressing. Okay, um, it's it's week one. The programs you're no, asking them to write at no, this point no, no, are things no, it's like, week, it's like, what week, is your name? It's like week three, uh, four now. But oh man, but, but yeah, the, the they're building the program, Halo at this point. The pro, yeah, no, the program they're writing is is literally print three lines, and. Uh, like well, okay. take, take two things of input and print three lines based on it, and okay. um, we have students pulling significantly more advanced code directly from YouTube videos. So that's going to be a fun thing to uh, wait. Why to are handle. you? Why are there? Okay, I mean, I know that we've put content on YouTube, so the barrier is pretty low. But I, it's <laughs> it's, it's not our assignment. It's something remotely related that. People are finding it's something it's something that that is similar, but different in a very, very important and obvious way. And students are taking that and just rather than and and, because it takes in a number of parameters that that version and they're just hard coding all the parameters except the one they need to change. That's so yeah, it seems a bit like overkill. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it it stands out a bit when there's like you know nested for loops in a program that should otherwise just be inputs and print states so, and so, literally so, that's it. So what we have here is the case of students who could have literally written three lines of code, but <laughs> like instead seven. went a okay whatever seven <laughs> lines of code, but then instead they went off to YouTube and figured out how to write a neural net that would like learn yeah. how to write the program for them. Yeah, but I mean, at least the neural net would, would the neural network would be learning. So, uh, <laughs> oh, so that, that's you know, I have no idea if our kids in our class are cheating right now. Like literally, right? Like, I, 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 I guess it's harder to cheat it, in our class, but well, it's also it's it it's easier to detect with code, um, despite what students seem to think. 
Well, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of we have a lot of tools uh that that help us with that's that. That's not that's not a nice way to talk about the Oh, you mean ways of of looking for things. You weren't talking about your students being tools. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Those are those are my TAs. No. Oh, okay. um, so, no. No. My TAs are <laughs> no, wonderful. No, they're in that they are helping you find all of these. But the other thing is that the TAs sometimes will see will see some of this stuff and they won't know what's going on. They're not trained to look for this sort of thing. No, but a lot of our TAs are experienced enough to know that we haven't taught for loops yet or <laughs> if statements, let alone if statements inside of nested for loops. And they'll be like, hey, this looks weird. And then once I know what I'm looking for, I can find the assignments that did it. Yeah. Well, this week, and I actually don't even know how we came to this theme, but we were, but we we came to the idea of talking about games that that mean something to us, or games mm -hmm. games that have meaning, or any way that you kind of want to to evaluate that. And before we get into it, I actually want to talk about why we play games. Why do people play games? Period. And there is a paper out of uh, Northwestern uh, by Hunnicky, LeBlanc, and Zubek that um, I use in my game design course. Uh, some other game designers reference this, um, and it's called the Mechanics Dynamics Aesthetics paper, MDA paper. And the quick version is that a mechanic... Can I, can I guess what the quick version is? Sure. About why people play games? Okay. To avoid thinking about the fact that we're all going to die. Oh, well, there you go. So, yeah, to avoid COVID and I all mean, that. That <laughs> it, it doesn't seem. No, no, no. Just, 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 just the thought of, you know, eventually in the long run, you know. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe that's it. Is that what the paper says? I'm going to. It, it is. It is one paragraph. It says we interviewed people who mm -hmm. they stared into that dark, dark abyss and saw their life light uh, winking away and decided this was the time to turn on Final Fantasy VII and yeah. Fortnite. Uh, to to to, uh, to to quote Bojack Horseman, the key to happiness is to distract yourself with meaningless things, and eventually you'll be dead. Okay then. Great so, great show, by the way. I uh, so mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. <laughs> well, we can dive into each of these more in future episodes, but suffice it to say that mechanics are the way that you interact with the game. Dynamics is what happens during kind of the game, the way the gameplay evolves. But aesthetics is what I want to talk about. There are, according to the paper, and then also uh, evaluated by other game designers, nine aesthetics. And these aesthetics are emotional reasons that what? people play games. Okay. And so I, I was wondering if we could see if we could, if you could go through them, see if you could figure some out. And then I okay. want to talk about our games and see how we might rationalize how... Uh, people play them. Okay, so one is in the era of microtransactions. It's social peer pressure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the, I mean, you know, this is why, for example, uh, an NBA game that people just want to play online, why it forces you to spend like three minutes or five minutes running through a city filled with other people, which is an incredibly network taxing process. That could easily be replaced by a menu, which was faster, more user-friendly, and easier. Why? Because you have to see all the people around you with their fancy microtransaction items. And, uh, you know, that's on top of the fact that the game is, is straight-up pay-to-win. So, so social peer pressure, that's got to be a big one for, for at least modern gaming. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, we're talking aesthetic, so, you know, everyone always talks about next-gen, and as we all know, next-gen is brown. Just just look at any like launch title and it just looks brown. Well, you know, there's only so brown many color is realistic. Palettes. Well, yeah, but brown is realistic. So brown we have is have realistic. Brown. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to go with uh, the aesthetic of taking things out of the game or adding diff uh, unnecessary inconveniences to the game and then selling you the solution. Kind of in line with microtransactions, but I assume some of these are related. Um, and then I'm going to go with delays. That's a very important aesthetic oh, in gaming these okay. days. All right. Okay. okay. So, so I, I know I hit four of nine. So what are the other five? So actually, I'm going to argue, well, okay, 
you're obviously pulling our leg a little bit here, but you actually did hit one. Brown? And it's not necessarily <laughs> brown. Yeah, no, uh, it, it, not necessarily social peer pressure, but fellowship games is social framework that there is the notion that we play games to be with other people in some way. Now, you you mm-hmm. you are making the argument that people that this is a forced social framework in order to you know, let people show off their bling. But part of the reason they play the game is so they can show off their bling. Look True. at any, look at any, any MMO, mm-hmm. uh, your World of Warcrafts, your, 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 um, Final Fantasy 14s. You right. want to show off the cool, cool armor that you got. Yeah. I guess this is where, and then and, and this isn't the, to, to get off topic because we'll, we'll go back to it. I, I so I, I, I agree that like unlocking cosmetics and designing your character is a very important player motivation, which is why I get really bothered when people say, oh, no, it's OK to have microtransactions if they're just cosmetic, like mm. not have a way to unlock them in the game. I, that that actually is something that that bothers me a lot, that they're. That they're OK with just, oh, well, we can charge this just that particular group of players money. Extra we should we should do an episode on not only the economics of, of games, but microtransactions yeah. and software in general and how yeah. to, and now how do we you know make money as software as a service sort of thing. That's right. a, that's a that's a future. That's, episode. A, that's, okay. a, that's a different rabbit hole. I don't want to get too far down it anyway. All right. So you got one. Um. All right. In, in all seriousness. Um. And this this is admittedly coming from a perspective that I have. Mm-hmm. Um. I like to explore a a a world, and this is, is why, for example, mm-hmm. exploration. Yeah, D- discovery is the official name in yeah. the MDA paper. But you're absolutely right. Game okay. as exploring uncharted territory. Go ahead, explain it. Uh, yeah. So to be clear, I haven't actually read the paper. Um, oh, yeah. I, and I offered to, but someone, someone told me not to. I thought um, it would be more fun to have you work through them. But so, so for my view, it is not just. Because because you could make arguments that there are like these big open world games that are all about exploring. It's not just that for me, though. So I like reading a lot of epic fantasy. So things mm-hmm. like Song of Ice and Fire. I'm currently working on The Wheel of Time, Malazan, Book of the Fallen. And what I really enjoy in those books, even more than the plot line, is learning how that world works, learning the history sure. of that world, the interlocking systems there. And so... You know, some of my favorite games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age have these really fleshed out histories to them. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not not just what's going on in the world, who the characters are, places to go, but also the the social and political dynamics of the world are are very fascinating. So so that's a big thing that draws me into games. Um, I I do like exploring spaces if there's something to find. Little Man Sky, pardon me. Oh, gosh. Um, Breath of the Wild's overrated. Sorry, I just I had this weird cough. Um, I think the explorations in the finding rather than just the aimless wandering. So, in, in my opinion, but no, but I, no, I think that I I think that's great. And the other thing I want to touch on specifically with discovery is, um, it is the notion that you meant in that you are exploring a world, you're exploring a culture, you're exploring that. But discovery also, in the terms of the MDA paper, refers to exploring interactions. And it could be something as simple as in Hearthstone, learning how certain cards mm-hmm. play into another thing. It is going into an environment that you don't necessarily know what's going on and you are learning the systems. Right. So discovery is pretty broad. Mm-hmm. And you started to go into another one talking I- about. You love epic fantasy. Right. Uh, so story. Game is narrative. Yes. Yep. Narrative. Yep. Um, this is a big one for me. And it actually started with... Um, I, I, before I went to college, I actually played a lot of sports games. And I still actually do college football just because I'm from West Virginia. We have no pro teams. But uh, I got away from them in college because I... So the first... like what I'd call modern-ish RPG I played, and it, of course, is not modern anymore, was Knights of the Old Republic. And that got me into very much story and character-driven RPGs. Mm-hmm. So that that is certainly something. And and I guess it does need to be much more story-driven in, in my case, um, mm-hmm. rather than just... Um, like, as opposed to Breath of the Wild, where there's a very, very minimal story 
and there's very kind of minimal development and growth throughout the story. Maybe we uh, shouldn't talk about Breath of the Wild. <laughs> uh, no, I mean people are people are gonna get mad, but that's fine. <laughs> no, uh, it's no, just no, like we're but, gonna but get but as we're gonna compared to as compared to Ocarina of Time. So I was using I was con- I was gonna contrast it with another Zelda game where even though there's not a lot of dialogue, that game still has a, a very well developed story and sense of mm-hmm. time and growth and change. And so I think that's a big motivator for me is is the change that occurs as a result of Cool. Yes, absolutely. Narrative being one of those aesthetics that carry over directly from mm. novels and right, um, yeah. movies and other mm. and other forms of media. All right, great. You've you've got three so far. Okay. Uh, I'm we gonna can try another one. Please. Mastery. Uh, that is specifically, I'm thinking in this context, things like competitive games, where you're trying to exhibit more expertise than the than the individual you are playing against so the phrasing here it's it, it's competition mm-hmm. uh, and the phrasing i really like is games as expression of dominance okay and so you know not my just cup the, of tea. The, what it's it's not my cup of tea but yeah well, it, it, it's important for a wait, lot of wait, people. wait 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 you play a competitive moba yeah but i don't care about actually like hitting master at it i play it no no more. no no, no. Well, Okay, so so maybe we're maybe we're diverging here okay. a little bit, but the notion of I have a skill set and I'm going to take my skill set and compare it, quote unquote, to someone else's skill set. Mm-hmm. I mean, Hearthstone, in any competitive Magic: The Gathering, in any Super Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, MOBAs, like like you play, mm-hmm. um, is a way of just. It, it, it sounds almost fierce to be um, games as dominance, but it is the notion of you are. It's the, not the opposite of fellowship, but they are, you know, somewhat dichotomous. Right. I mean, I, I would actually argue specifically with MOBAs, I'm more driven by the fellowship side of things of, of playing with other players. There's actually a community I'm involved in as opposed to the competition. We are going to get into that about okay. the number right. of aesthetics that the, the, the games the deal with. So, all right. Okay. Perfect. All right. All right. We got four. Um... And if you need help, I'll give you games that have that are key elements of this aesthetic. All right, go ahead. How about uh, Tetris? How about um, any match three game? How about um, Candy I mean, Crush, which is those, a are, match those are puzzle games. Uh, problem solving. So th- this is one of the trickier ones, but I-, I didn't know another way of getting to it. It's approachability, it's, uh, abnegation, games as pastime, game as time waster, game as you get in the zone and you're okay. just doing it. And it's so th- this is the notion so of like many Breath mo- of the Wild. I'm joking. Um, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll it's stop. probably a lower level one. Okay. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. All right. Here's another one. Dance Dance Revolution. Uh, Guitar Hero. Um, Res, Child Stor- of Eden, not Child of Eden. Is that the one? Uh, Rhythm mm. Games. Um, I'm trying to think of how that translates. Uh, expression? No, because it's not. You're not really expressing anything. They give you the. I mean, I was going to assume creativity was one, but I don't think that's what you're going for here. Creativity is one. We can get. We can jump to that right. one in a second. This is another one that I didn't know how to get to. It's sensation game. Okay, okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, game for sense pleasure. So it's a game you go back to because of some sort of specialized graphics or audio or interaction pattern or something like that. Okay, Uh, game is expression. Absolutely right. So uh, Mario Maker Mm -hmm. Two, Little Big Planet, um, anything, and even then, um, Mass Effect. Is expression because it is a I, I, mm-hmm. the, you, folks at no, home. I you see cannot what you're see this. It, it tied within the tied within the narrative. Well, but in in Mass Effect, you are expressing your own values by right. choosing the path of how you answer questions, whether you go down a Paragon path or a evildoer right path, sort of thing. And uh, so that is yeah. one. I don't remember what the terms are for Mass Effect, but yeah. that is. One way of doing expression is how do you express yourself in a character? In mm-hmm. an MMO, it could be the fact that you chose druid over mage, the armor you choose. It is a way of expressing yourself. It's kind of a corner way of describing expression, but that's certainly another one. Okay. Um, 
We only have two left, I believe. Um, this is another one that I, I don't know if we're going to get to, but it, in it has the same category of uh, any NFL game, any um, soccer game, but also Call of Duty or um, uh, surgeon. Role playing. So, yeah, game is fantasy. Game is make believe. Right. Game is uh, I can you know go into these mm-hmm. shoes and be something I'm normally not. And finally, the last category: every Super Mario Brothers game. Um, gosh, any 2D platformer, any 3D platformer, Ratchet and Clank. Um, uh, I mean, playing for the sake of completion or uh, um, collection? No. It's challenge, game as obstacle course. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so to review, the nine are sensation game mm-hmm. is sense pleasure fantasy right. game is make-believe narrative right. game is drama mm-hmm. challenge game is obstacle course fellowship game is a social framework discovery game is un- is exploring uncharted territory expression game is a way of self-discovery and self uh self-actualization uh abnegation game as time waster game is pastime and competition game as dominance over someone else what? So these nine aesthetics, the way that the paper goes into this design mentality is when we're trying to come up with the requirements for making a game, I and mean, we can say when you press A, Mario go up this much or something mm-hmm. like that. But the, that's not what we actually want the user to feel at the end. You know, the fact that Mario does jump, how does that translate to anything how does that help us understand whether this is a good game bad game interesting game whatever Mm -hmm. and so the the argument the paper is the mechanics that you program in the game turn into dynamics which are runtime how does the player interact with the system and then how does that generate emotional response okay and so you know what i was hoping we could think about was with some of the games that like i i came up with a few i'm sure you came up with a few too Mm -hmm. um why are these games important? How, what, what uh, aesthetics are they touching on? Mm -hmm. And it's important to know that most games have one or two aesthetics that are kind of the primary, at least this is the argument, one or two that are primary. And then several others, you know, there's some, there's some aspect to them. As you noted, something like breath of the wild is discovery. Probably first is is up there with, with narrative. It's there. But it's, you know, is it? it's, yes, it is, <laughs> because you have, I'm not going to get into it. You have to go find all of the memories and find out what happened over the past hundred years since. Okay, yeah, I, anyway. I just Googled it because I got tired of it. All right, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll stop bashing it. <laughs> so, my, my opinions are clear. So, uh, is there a game that, yeah. that, what, what, that, that, that has had an effect on you that, you know what well so i mean we 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 both know this at this point i'm a huge fan of the mass effect series um all three of the games Mm -hmm. because there are only three as as we know (laughs) Uh, they were all released in the trilogy pack there there were no other mass effect games to speak of. no no other ones that start with the letter Uh, a so uh with mass effect certainly narrative is the big driver but specifically within Mass Effect, and this was kind of normal with Bioware games, I would then say, as, as you mentioned, the expression of values is certainly yes. there. Um, See, because Mass yeah. Effect is not a game that we would necessarily look at and say, this is a shooter. I mean, yeah. there is shooter mechanics, but if you're looking for that sort of mm-hmm. challenge aesthetic, that sort of, you know, competition aesthetic, you're probably going to other shooter. You're going to Mass. You want to play Mass Effect because you want to be in that world. Right. Yeah. And um, in, and that's that's kind of the one. I mean, ex- I would argue myself that the you know the thing that sets the game apart is the expression side of it. The fact that you have these very different journeys depending on choices you make throughout three games, uh, because they do the they, it was one of like the the big motivators of the game was that your choices from the first game affected the second and third game, and then the second game affected the third game. Um. So for so for our listeners who who aren't necessarily familiar with Mass Effect, I mean yeah. you don't need to give the whole history of it, but right. you know how how does this narrative take place over the three games, and and how how do your decisions 
have an effect on the way the story unfolds. Yeah, so so it it's kind of a standard like by it, it it's the same story in the first pretty much in the first game as as Knights of the Old Republic. There is some great ancient thing and it's kind of the thing that can lead to galaxy to ruin and you have to find the thing. And that's the first game, but in doing so you set up choices such that as the story develops a, a deeper conflict develops in the galaxy. So this is actually set in the Milky Way galaxy with humanity's future is is the idea and and uh, sort of you know there's all these other different species that we interact with some friendly some unfriendly but um, I don't want to spoil actually kind of the, the crux of the first game even though most people probably know what it is uh, but. In the third game, you end up needing a lot of allies, and choices that you make can affect how many allies you have, how mm. well you're able to maintain the alliances that you have. Um, for example, there's a particular ending point in the um, in in Mass Effect Three. A particular kind of story branch ends with there's a a, a race that made AI that ended up kind of overthrowing the, the race itself. It was actually an homage to Battlestar Galactica, and at the end of the uh, at the end of this arc, if you want the ending that's the best, which is you end up with with a, a sort of a, a piece, you have to have done certain things in Mass Effect Two, because otherwise, Ooh. otherwise the the two groups won't trust you enough to be willing to broker a piece on on your terms. Gosh, but but even so, and I think this is an interesting to think about because there are plenty of gamers that look at games and and see that there is a quote unquote best ending or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Right. And that there is a concrete goal they're trying to head towards. And if they don't get that best ending that they did, did something, quote unquote, wrong. Right. And I think one of the powers of the medium of gaming is that you can play through the, the trilogy mm -hmm. and I could play through the trilogy and we both have divergent experiences and our own story is being told. And that's one of the things that can be just so much more powerful mm -hmm. than, I mean, I'm not trying to, to no, no, you know, I agree. I, I agree. Novels or, you know, or, or, right. or movies by a stretch of the imagination. It's just, it is a power in gaming that we can have mm -hmm. one piece of media ha have two very different effects. Exactly. Um, I mean, obviously there's, there's a couple of issues with the, the actual ending of Mass Effect 3, the actual end of the game, but if you view it not as just strictly the last five minutes of the game, but all the different storylines that had played out over the trilogy ending, mm -hmm. there are some truly different endings that you can get, and there are, I mean, in Mass Effect 2 in particular, there's a choice you make that ethically I still don't know what the right decision is. It, it it um do you steal that donut from the gallery the galley well basically the, the it ends the universe the the short version is you have a bunch of sentient ai and the question is can you reprogram them so they become your allies or can you or do you destroy them and if you think of it from a standpoint of if i could change some human beings thoughts such that they no longer disagree with me on something like not not through persuasion, but literally just by hitting a button, is that morally correct? I don't know. Uh, so that's there's a there's a choice there in Mass Effect Two, which I, I still think is interesting. Wow. So yeah, wow. That yeah, mm -hmm. I, I haven't finished the trilogy. <laughs> and so it's the, yeah, I'm, I'm trying uh, to be vague because I don't want to like give things away. I mean, although you probably know. What's well, like twenty what, what years old time. now? I mean, I should have. It's not twenty years old. It's like <laughs> Mass Effect One came out like fourteen years ago. Oh, okay. I'm off by just a handful Mass Effect of years. Two or Mass Effect Three came out. I don't even think ten years ago yet. I thought it was twenty twelve. Well, staying in the in kind of the general realm of narrative and discovery and also expression, um, there's a game that I when when I teach game design, I try to have all my students play. And that's Gone Home. Have you ever played Gone Home? I have. I have. And I think Gone Home is a game that anyone who has never played games before or is not 
super interested in games is a game that they could play. Um, it is not very long. I think you can, I mean, you technically can finish it, I think, in a minute and 30 seconds. There is um, actually a speed running community, by the way. Y- yeah, it, it's, and it, it, you don't do that because that's just because <laughs> you just know which button to press at the very end. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 the idea of the game is that you are a college student, a young lady in the, in the 1980s, mm-hmm. late 80s, early 90s. And you go abroad for a semester. And while you're abroad, your family moves to a new home. Your your mother, your father, and your sister move to a new home. And you get back from studying abroad late at night. You get to the house. There's a note there saying your sister has run away. And the house is completely, has no people in it whatsoever. And you know, you might think that while you're going through the house at some point, some there's going to be some jump scare or something. No, there's mm-hmm. none of that. But what it is, is two or three hours of the best environmental storytelling mm-hmm. you will ever see. I agree. You are and, going th- oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, there is, there is, and it, it, there's layers to the story. Because there's oh, the main yeah. story that you basically can't miss that involves... You know, finding these tape recordings that kind of explain what's going on with the family life, etc. But there are all these clues to some deeper family history that emerge that people still speculate on um, that are that are not as obvious that if you do more digging, you'll find. And I think that kind of layered narrative is also uh, very valuable. Exactly. I, and the. The, the fact that you you learn things by and the, I'm I'm not this isn't spoiling much of anything but for instance you go into your father's study and you find boxes of his unsold novel and you you can dig more into uh, things that have failed in his career and you find out more about his relationship with your mother and and as as Will said you know you can you can skip a lot of this mm-hmm. but. If you are really invested in the story and you try to find things out, you open drawers, you find pieces of paper, you you get a little bit more. And so there's this notion of not only the narrative as as a primary aesthetic and also discovery as you are going through through this house. It turns out that there was a lot of fellowship here as well, not mm-hmm. necessarily in the game, right? Because it's intended to be a solo experience, but that as as noted their communities came out like, like book clubs effectively mm-hmm. popped up around this game where people would play it and, you know, get together to, to talk about, well, what did you find and what do you think happened? And it, it is, it, it, it's a beautiful story. One, um, it, it, it is a little creepy because you are walking through a house in the dark. And if that yeah. bothers you, and th- the thing is, is one of the, the first time I played it was in 20, was in 2011. And, um, the aftershocks of the 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 earthquake that we mentioned a few episodes. <laughs> oh, that happened. Hit, hit while I was playing the game, and I was, it was very creepy huh. to, to play a game and then a you know earthquake aftershock hits. But um, uh, you can find you can find um, Gone Home on. It just came out on Switch just mm-hmm. recently. Um, but you can find it just for a song on PC. You know, literally like two three bucks. Yeah. Um, absolutely worth worth people's time. Um, the last narrative one. I'm not going to say anything about it because I think you should go in blind. To the moon, the oh. most the most emotionally affecting game I have ever played, and it is not close. There is no voice acting. It is all pixel art. It is far and away the most emotionally destroying piece of media I have consumed. I played enough to know that my my psyche could not take it at that at my point in life when I was trying to play it, I was like, Nope, I am not, mm-hmm. I'm not in a place where I can do this, but it, it is, it is incredible to see how storytellers have adapted to the media mm-hmm. uh, of gaming. Um, what remains of Edith, Edith, Edith Finch. That's mm-hmm. another one. Um, Dear Esther, which was made by also by the Chinese room. Which yeah. Was, that's yeah. A, yeah. Yep, another one. That's another. There's good also one. a speedrunning community for that too, which is, which is, if you if you know Dear Esther, you know how hilarious that concept is. 
There's no running in the game. You have yeah, to walk you, at the slow speed. You walk possible. insanely slow. Uh, and it's like people trying to speed run with with a broken leg through a museum is the best way I can describe it. Um her story I think I, I, which is um it is it is all it, it, it's done from um live action video but I you're remember looking this one now, yeah. at, you're looking at recordings of mm-hmm. someone talking about um I believe domestic abuse. I, I'm, I'm blanking right now about because there's presumably police tapes. Yeah, um, I, I can't actually recall. I, I don't. I haven't, I haven't played the game, so and I, I kind of avoided trying to read into what it's about because I, I want to play it someday. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, um, enough downers. I guess not downers, <laughs> but but you know, uh, so, so right. these are all really heavy narratives. Mm-hmm. But that's not why people play all games. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, if you. The, the the gaming community worldwide uh, with the advent of smartphones has moved so heavily. If you just look at just anyone that plays any game whatsoever has shifted um, so far into the type of. I don't want to say garbage that you find <laughs> on mobile no, devices. But, but you're right. There is some what I would call shovelware. Just, you know, getting it out the door to shovel it out and just see, see what sticks. But there are some good ones out there. Do you have any, do, do you play many mobile games like Abnegation sort of mobile game, just waste time? Um, not really. No, uh, I mostly if I, if I'm, if I'm, I mean, if I need, if I waste time with my phone, it is usually either reading or perusing Reddit of games I play. So many folks know of Flappy Bird yes. um, when that was a thing. Um, and, and since that game has come out, um, there have been plenty of other games that have kind of tried to match uh, along the, uh, along that same idea of having something that you just kind of play to to get through. And there are games th- on um, on iOS like Cut the Rope, mm-hmm. um, which is a puzzle game. And it is a cute, cute little monster. That it just it's the cutest little thing, and there's a swinging peppermint, and you have to cut the rope at the right time and the right angle to make it swing and land in his mouth. And you go through several puzzles trying to do this sort of thing, and it is a perfect time waster. Mm-hmm. Tiny wings, you are a, a cute little bird, and you only control is when you press down on the screen, the bird tilts down to kind of dive downwards, right. and you make just this soothing motion. And there are plenty of games. Every match three game out there, um, are very important. I, I use the term important pretty loosely here, but that it has normalized the idea of playing video games because mm-hmm. when we were kids, you know, it was, Oh, you're going to go over and play Nintendo. Okay. That's just, that's for kids. That's, and that stigma is not really there anymore. It, it, when we if think it, if about anything, only old people have consoles now. <laughs> that's, that's shockingly true, actually. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, what other games have affected you, or or did you did you want yeah. to did you talk so, about? So to to intentionally avoid retrotting ground, um, I would throw out there. Um, I actually don't want to say Heroes of the Storm here. Um, I'm intentionally not going to talk about Hearthstone, so that's fine. Right. I. Man, I'm, I'm act- uh, so. Do you want it? Do you have one in hand? I, I'm admittedly, I, I, I had something for this to quote Archer, but I actually did have something for this. Um, okay, we can come back to you if you want to. You want to yeah, think yeah, about yeah. it, but um, I think what's really been interesting for me over the past couple years is how my daughter Sammy has gotten more interested in video games. Mm. And I remember getting my Nintendo when I was eight years old and um, uh, playing the original Super Mario Brothers and the sense of discovery of just playing that game and, and, and renting games and things like that. And at the same time, I was very much into Legos. Still am. Love Legos. Legos are fantastic. Sammy's into Legos, too. And so the fact that there's a game called Mario Maker 2 for the Switch where Sammy's enthusiasm about making things Mm -hmm. and also she has just fallen in love with the mario universe she has stuffies of every mario character although Mm -hmm. technically they 
technically half of them were mine and they were in my office and she has right. absconded with them and now they are hers. So right. uh, on my wish list for Christmas this year, mom, you're listening, is all these stuffies <laughs> on my Amazon list to, re- <laughs> to, to, to refurnish my office. Uh-huh. Um, but she has taken such pride in making levels for mm-hmm. me to play. And it, it, it it's a way of, of interacting with her and with interacting with games that... Uh, I mean, I, I, I certainly, you know, play games on occasion with 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 my dad and definitely with my brother. But, you know, being in the parental seat here mm-hmm. and having my kids say, here, play my Mario level. I, you know, there is a sen- there's a sense of fellowship there, if we want to think about it in, in that sort of aesthetic, because it's she's playing the, specifically to to share something with me. Um, it is definitely expression. It is her showing off uh, her, mm-hmm. you know, what she thinks is cool in, in Mario games. And I've definitely learned which which power ups she thinks are the coolest and how she likes she likes to build things. Um, but then, you know, she'll go and she'll make her own worlds and 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 set everything up. And so um, seeing that and seeing her also in games like Mario Odyssey, just, I want to, I just want to go to new Doc city and I just want to run around. I want to climb every building. Mm-hmm. I just right. want to jump on the taxis and just be in that world. And I love that. I think it's, I, I think it's so wonderful. And, um, I mean, there are plenty of games that, that I play way too much hearthstone. Mm-hmm. I, I it, it, there should be a drinking game. Like you have to take it, <laughs> take it, take a drink. Every time you hear me, we're, say the word hearthstone mm-hmm. um pit legend today it was great um so <laughs> <laughs> i did this quest shaman it was great yeah. um you know i play that i, I do play that for competition and, and you know also abnegation i've learned i should not be queuing games when cooking dinner that's not right, good for yeah. either my rank or for dinner <laughs> it yeah. doesn't seem to help food get done soon but you know when, when i think about games that are or experiences that have been important or, or powerful or whatever. I think of either the stories I've, I've experienced. Right. Um, or now it's, it's experiencing it with Sammy. Right. And so one, one thing you kind of brought up there was the, the nature of the level creation. And also the idea that Sammy will go to new donk city in, in Super Mario Odyssey, and we'll just run around and explore and everything. It's it's much more unstructured in in <laughs> that. True. And so so there are games that very much emphasize structure, like Mass Effect, which mm-hmm. which is is pretty much explicitly a structured game almost in, in in some ways. There's a particular set of events that you can do, and you do them in a specific order and reach a specific endpoint. Uh, whereas, and and I think. I I see a preference change kind of with people not much younger than me. There's a lot more interest in in unstructured play there, things like Minecraft. Minecraft, yeah. Things yep. like yep. Fortnite as I would say a lot more. I mean, yes, there's the structure of you're playing this big battle royale, etc., but there's it's not like a a narrative experience. There's a lot of different ways to play um there's expression in the dances that right. you choose and the outfits that you buy and all things right. like that. There's ways of, of customizing it so that you're trying to mm-hmm. be a part of that fellowship, part of that community. Right. Whereas me, like I see a fin, I, I, I want to see a finish line that I can cross. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That way I know that when the game is sitting on my shelf for years at a time, I can just feel that finish line just staring at me, judging from the bookshelf. No, um, but so the, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna say so you could see that and relive some of those experiences. I certainly no, but, like but that. That's actually a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But so I like I uh, and and oftentimes is described as as theme park versus sandbox. It, yes. A way. Yes. And I and what I find is specifically with the games that I like, they're very much more theme park based. They're they're very rarely sandbox based. Uh, and I and I say this saying yes, I do play Heroes of the Storm and and multiplayer games um you know tend to be kind of more sandbox ish cuz the idea is you you know you're competitively playing against players so you get the emergent player versus player mechanics and that's what drives the interest in the game mm-hmm. um 
I don't want to say that I actually love Heroes of the Storm because I don't. It's kind of just one of those like, yeah, but I have a community there that I keep coming back to. So going back That's... to the, the taxonomy, it's much more fellowship driven and yes, somewhat dominance driven. But for me specifically, it's, it's more driven by the fellowship side of it. And that's so that is completely valid. Mm-hmm. And I have I have friends who play Hearthstone or let me I should even say now played Hearthstone, right. but they are still active in all of the discord channels. They follow the same people on Twitter. We all chat in those things. And maybe they watch people play the game from occasion. But I think that there, there's at least one friend I'm thinking of who I honestly don't think has launched the game in over a year. But yet I still see him in all of the discord channels, mm-hmm. you know, because of the fellowship of the community that was that was created around that right. experience. Right. And, and so and, and that's kind of the that's I mean kind of my relationship with with Heroes of the Storm especially because the game's kind of been on the downtrend, but it's I to I, mean, I, I play it. Um but I play in the league not not to try to win. Uh but just just for the uh the the community side of it. And yes, mm-hmm. I mean there's still a dominance factor. And so I guess what I what I'm asking is relative to this paper is it seems then that these these aesthetics that we're talking about are somewhat flexible in terms of what we would mean by fellowship in Gone Home versus fellowship sure. oh, yes. in, in Heroes of the Storm. In my case, um, you know, like I, I like I do like playing now. Whenever I play Mass Effect, I always play it on on the highest difficulty. Because I actually like the challenge side of it to add to the narrative side of it, and I've mm-hmm. I've played Mass Effect through more times than I will willingly admit uh, on recording. So <laughs> um, I'll wait till later to ask. Yeah, but uh, but so I, I think there's certainly that flexibility there, and I guess then it's not some immutable characteristic that a game is released and you can give it like a, a number on each of these scales because I think it's going to vary a little bit for different people. Based on their preference, based on you know being more theme parky versus mm-hmm. being more sandboxy, you're you're absolutely correct. And in fact, there's a video um, on YouTube. The, the channel is called Extra Credits. They are fantastic. Oh, I love they extra do. credits. Yeah, extra credits. Fit. So they have a video on this paper. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll I'll send it to you. I'll put it in the show notes. Yada yada yada. But they specifically go into Minecraft. Minecraft. Their argument is someone who plays on the survival server is playing a completely different game of Minecraft than the people right. who are doing monument building sort of things in that there are some games that are so large that you don't necessarily engage with all of the aesthetics, but you actually focus in on it. So something like Grand Theft Auto five, you could do it for the narrative. You could do it for the fantasy. You could do it for the challenge. You could do it there. It, it actually encompasses most of the aesthetics in some mm-hmm. way. But depending on how you engage with it, that's the experience you want to have. Yeah. So like when I played Minecraft, uh, once the the Ender Dragon update came out and that was considered like the final boss, I did it for the purposes of beating that. The same way that when I play Terraria, I do it for the purposes of beating the Moon Lord. So Terraria, very similar in in that respect. I mean, you would argue very similar games overall, Mm -hmm. though there's there's key differences, especially in terms of the moment to moment action. But that said, I've never been in the monument building community, and yet I'll go and, you know, see that someone's like, oh, yeah, I just recreated, like, King's Landing. You know, oh, yeah. one, one, one-to-one scale King's Landing, and then, like, half of it get blown up in the show, and so they're just like, oh, I guess I'm going to need some TNT, and they start farming creepers for that, you know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, they're... they're and, and I think that the sandboxy games actually allow for more of that flexibility like it's hard to play mass effect in a much different way than what was intended uh um, that's true and, and, and true. that could be kind of that that difference um i don't know and it it's g- games are neat mm. games are neat games are art and that you know we could, we could go to that at some right. point too that just how how powerful that medium is um not only for you know, the narratives and stories, the experiences, but also, you know, just um, how it brings people together and also for, you know, picking up some sweet loots. So, yeah. um, uh, well, can we, we oh, quick question. So oh, now please. that we've kind of talked about these aesthetics and we can throw out it quickly. Is there a game that has fundamentally disappointed you 
and why. And if you need time to think about it, I have one. By all means, go right ahead. Dragon Age Inquisition. Hmm. So, to explain why, um, a big thing that drew me into the Dragon Age games is that it, 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 it Dragon Age Origins especially, and, and Dragon Age 2 to somewhat a lesser extent, but still very much so, play like a tactics game. And I like that strategic you know, pause, think, act. It it it's real mm-hmm. time, but it's it's more kind of it, it can feel turn based if you want it to, and I really like that. Um, and story wise, it was still there. Narrative wise, it was still there, but a lot of the tactical features were missing, and I think they they put too much emphasis on exploration of space, and not enough emphasis on, for instance, challenge. Um, or, or specifically, uh, the, the game mechanics, the, the being able to combine, I guess the expression in the form of the combat, the combining abilities there, it's just not as present. And I just, it was very disappointing to me. Um, and then of course, No Man's Sky, because they very much advertised it as a theme park game. I mean, yes, sandbox, a bit sure. more exploration, you know, very heavy emphasis on exploration and stuff, but they're like, D- there's a goal, and you're going to get to the center of the universe, and you're going to learn as you go what's going on, and there's, there's literally, like, you get to the center of the universe, it's just another universe, except then eventually they run out of manually entered names, and it's all randomly generated gibberish, and that's it. Uh, so it is explicitly a sandbox game, and, and that, that disappointed me because of that. I think for me, when I am disappointed by a game, it's usually because there is a mismatch in the aesthetics that I am expecting or hoping to get out of a game, Mm -hmm. and the designers are focusing more on something else, and it is an impediment to me engaging with the game, the world, in the way that I want to. Exactly. I think the one that has disappointed me the most recently, and it is, from all accounts, a phenomenal game. People have been singing its praises. Is the Outer Wilds really? Um, it is. I in that game, there is a sense of loneliness mm-hmm. and existential dread. Yes, dread. Yes, yes. <laughs> that That's is the right inc- word for it. That is incredible. It's very uncomfortable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the notion of exploring space and controlling the ship in that interesting way and trying to find out what's going on in the world is very appealing to me. Um, but I think just for me personally, I I I was not able to engage in the game because there was this kind of extra layer mm-hmm. put onto it that just made me feel uncomfortable. Another one that, that that this is another kind of hard, hard to um, admit to the Diablo games, Mm -hmm. which honestly should be smack dab in my wheelhouse. And they are games that I look at and go, gosh, darn it. I should, I really should get into Diablo three. This is it's, it's loot. It's, it's blizzard game. It should love it. And I think it's just not engaging with me in the right, aesthetics that i mean i can play it i'm like oh yeah this is kind of neat this is kind of fun but it's it's never been something that has just grabbed me and and held me in that gameplay loop that i know that it holds for so many people right yeah um what the other the other thing i would add to is one game that was and i haven't actually played it but one game that was very divisive which it kind of relates to what you talked about with the emotional sense of it was last of us part two because oh, even gosh. people who liked the game <coughs> didn't openly like said, it. <laughs> yeah, they openly said yeah. it was uncomfortable to play. It was, it, it forces, it, it, it kind of, not, not, not necessarily, it pushes you towards doing things that end up having these very emotional uh, uh, blowbacks. And mm-hmm. The, the the interesting th- so there was an article which was much maligned because of it it's it compared the last of us part 2 to schindler's list and people are like what you know you can't compare it to that cuz that's just such a such a great movie and and i agree but their point wasn't it's not saying oh this is as good as that movie it's that 
book there are books and movies that you read that are not fun oh gosh but are yes. still great and mm -hmm. gaming mostly is still fun and yeah there'll be like some emotional low yeah. points and things like that in the narrative but ultimately the the gameplay emphasis is very much on fun or you know there it it's you know the hero's story of overcoming some obstacles or yeah. escapism on several level. Right, but but that escapism often comes, like, even when there's a low point in the story, it's almost always so that you can triumph over it. Like, that, that, sure. that triumph and fun is the end goal. And those aren't the only emotions. And, and media mm -hmm. is a great way to kind of be able to experience some of those different emotions in a, a, a frankly, a, a safe space that you know, you you don't you don't have to bear the burden of the consequences of that fictional story. That that's why humans like telling stories so much, uh, even if those stories are not explicitly narrative and focus, but the stories that we tell ourselves in playing these games. You know, like the ones that I tell myself while playing Heroes of the Storm, in terms of the community that I'm with, etc. Wow, that was my attempt yeah. at a spiel and a and a closer. That was no, that was. <laughs> That that I mean that that's the, that's the mic. I mean I would say do a mic drop, but I see it's no, on a no, boom arm, is, and I think that'd be that'd be really dangerous. It would also probably and, damage them. You should, by it, the way, if you're ever at an open mic night, don't drop the mic. It, they're expensive, <laughs> and they're very easy to damage. Just saying, if if you pay for the mic, saying. sure. Don't Thank drop the all. mic like you don't drop goats. Oh gosh, okay. Thank you all so much for joining us. We know that one of the most precious things that you have is time in your day, and you've spent a little bit with us, and we very much appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, we've given you some something to think about with uh, the games you play, or if you don't play games, you know, engage with games in some way, because I guarantee you that there is a game out there for every person that will touch on some aesthetic that will that will add some sort of richness to your life in some way. Here I am just advertising for games. They're good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you have the opportunity, we would so much appreciate if you left us a review on the podcast service of your choice, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, on Spotify, or at Anchor FM. It really would help us out. Uh, if you would like to leave us a message, you can email us at hosts at regraderequest.com. You can always go to regraderequest.com and click the record button right there on the window to record a message. If you would ever like to be the first person to <laughs> send us a question live, uh, we would love to hear from you. You can also and, find our, our entire oh, back say, catalog. Hmm. I was going to say, send us send us your thoughts on some of the games and the aesthetics that, that appeal to you in them. That would be a great way to solicit response for this episode specifically. There you go. Tell us a game that you like. Tell us what aesthetics it touches on or, or, you know, how it, how it has affected you. We would love to hear it. Absolutely would love to hear it. <sighs> so for myself and for professor Will McBurney, take care, be safe and watch for Fallen goats. Note to self, make Fallen goat arcade game. Licenses Spe to our podcast. Specifically, the narrative in a world where goats fall from the sky. And then, like, the main character, their father, has to be killed by a goat because we have to do the mono myth, right? The mono, a goat yes. that is falling. And he has to have a sword. <laughs> <laughs>